Today is Wednesday, March 15th, 2023, and we are so glad that you've decided to join us tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We've come together to study the book of Genesis, and we are in Genesis chapter 40 tonight. So I want to invite you to be joining us in the book of Genesis in chapter 40. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad to have you with us. And we also want to invite you to be with us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We're getting together to study the book of Isaiah. So from 9.30 until about 10.15, we'll look very carefully at a chapter or so in the book of Isaiah. Then at 10.30, uh, we have our worship assembly where we sing and pray and give and partake of the Lord's Supper. We plan on studying the Word of God together. And we'll be studying two verses in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. So if you want to reread Hebrews chapter 4, we'll be in that chapter this coming Lord's Day morning. As always... If you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. There's a lot of information on our website as well. We invite you to uh, look around there a little bit, do some exploring on that site, fourlakeschurch.org. And we would love to uh, have you stop by in that way as well. And if you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, this would be a great time to do that. And uh, make sure to sign up for notifications so that uh, you know when we go live next time also. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, this week, by the way, marks three years since we went completely online for the first time in our Wednesday evening Bible study. As you know, we had just upgraded our live stream capabilities a few months before this, back in the winter of 2020. You may remember for a year or so before that, we had a little cell phone that was clipped uh, to one of the, the speaker shelves in our auditorium. And we did that for quite some time to connect some of the uh, elderly of the congregation who were not able to come in on Wednesday evenings due to the distance involved and the time involved in driving and uh, certainly the danger of doing that in the winter. So we kind of pieced it together for a while. Uh, but finally, we decided to uh, do the upgrade. That was, again, sometime in the midwinter 2020. And then when COVID hit... Uh, we were about as prepared as we could have been, and that was such a, a good position to be in, as uh, terrible as that time was for us, but uh, everything was still pretty new to us, and so when we canceled our in-person study on Wednesday, March 18th, 2020, my son and I actually drove across town to the church building alone, just the two of us. And uh, I don't know if you've looked in the cry room at our church facility, but you'll notice the camera that's mounted high in the window in the cry room there. We simply uh, spun it around on its little mounting bracket up there, and we pointed it down at me sitting at the countertop back there in the cry room. Uh, it was so awkward uh, just talking to a camera and uh, not having any idea... If anybody was there, we were live, but I didn't know exactly what was going out, not knowing what was going out, uh, not knowing what that looked like, not knowing what the screen was like, and um, and really having no feedback, no idea whatsoever whether anybody was uh, actually watching or whether that feed was making it out of the building. Uh, and then only looking at it later did I figure out that I did that whole class with a trash can right beside my head. <laughs> <laughs> not not exactly the best backdrop to have there. <laughs> when I looked at that later, it got a giant trash can right beside my head there. Uh, but anyway, we got it done, and obviously we have made some improvements along the way over the past three years. Um, that evening I went home, I started thinking through, and uh, started working on the uh, live stream pulpit 1.0. <laughs> at least that's the way I described it. And I think I used that for a week or so, and that was very quickly updated and adapted. And I think we're on like live stream pulpit version 3 point something right now. I don't know. We've made a lot of little tweaks and adjustments through the years. So we moved from the crime room to our garage in front of the wood pile, if you remember that, for a year or so. Uh, we've had a number of classes live stream from some exotic locations, you might say. You know, Governor Dodge State Park, about an hour west of here. Blue Mound State Park, about half an hour west of Madison. And I uh, did at least one class, maybe two, from the shore of Lake Superior, uh, right there on the beach near Black River Harbor, up uh, about half an hour northeast of Ironwood. So we've had some kind of... Uh, uh, classes come from some far off places. We've had some guest teachers. Uh, Josh Yancey did a few from uh, from their living room. And uh, some of you have filled in in other ways as well. 
Um, but we're now doing this study from my home office on the southwest side of Madison. I was able to hang up a black sheet and adjust the lighting in here and uh, try to get things worked out a little bit here and there. We've learned a lot. Uh, but since we're at the three-year point, I thought some of you might appreciate this reminder of where we've been with this. So it's a, a lot different than it was, but we're very thankful for the uh, capability. Uh, but tonight we are back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings written by Moses, and we've looked at Adam and Eve and Noah and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and tonight we are back to Joseph, and we'll be with Joseph for the remainder of the book of Genesis. Uh, Joseph, of course, is the 11th and the favorite son of Jacob, and that, of course, was expressed through the coat of many colors, which led to Joseph being hated by his brothers and ultimately sold into slavery in Egypt. And in Egypt, uh, Joseph ends up in charge of Potiphar's household. We looked at that a week or two ago. Potiphar is the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard, so he's the head of the secret service, as we would describe that position today. So he's high up in the Egyptian hierarchy, government, and the bureaucracy there. Uh, however, in that position, Joseph is falsely accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. And he's completely innocent. He runs away from that. He is not at fault whatsoever. She is an evil woman. And he is subsequently then thrown into prison where he quickly rises to the top and ends up in charge of the prison. And it's interesting how that works out. God has a way of dealing with these things. And God blesses him all throughout that uh, very difficult time. So that brings us tonight to Genesis chapter 40 verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 40. And let's start tonight with verses 1 through 8. Genesis 40, verses 1 through 8. Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them, and they were in confinement for some time. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. Well, starting in verse 1, we start to get the impression that Pharaoh was a bit twitchy, wasn't he? I mean, he was uh, maybe the nervous type. Uh, very easily offended, and I know today people are also very easily offended. That's something we as God's people need to work on, not being easily offended. But uh, Pharaoh apparently was, uh, was very easily offended. So we've got Joseph in prison, now he's in charge of the prison, and meanwhile the cupbearer and this baker in some way offend their Lord. Now we aren't given the details here, but we may find it interesting that these men are not put to death, are they? At least not immediately. This is not that kind of offense, at least here at the beginning. And so I would say, in other words, they are probably not accused of something like poisoning Pharaoh's food or anything like that, but they are guilty of some lesser offense. Maybe the baker burned the bread, uh, you know, maybe the cupbearer was a few seconds too late providing the king with a, a refill of his favorite beverage or something like this. So they haven't necessarily uh, committed a crime that was, uh, you know, worthy of instant execution. So it's not quite at that level at this point, but they have offended the king in some way. And so as he deals with this, maybe as he decides what to do with these two men, he throws them in jail. And as we noted last week, this jail doesn't seem to be the place where average criminals might go. This is not the county lockup. This is not a city jail. But this seems to be maybe a place for political prisoners. This is the king's prison. And here it is described as the house of the captain of the bodyguard. In other words, this is still Potiphar's prison. And I don't know if we had this information in the previous chapter, but I think it's interesting. This means that Joseph, after being accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife, is now placed in Potiphar's prison 
where Potiphar is apparently the one who allows Joseph to move up in the prison hierarchy, even to the point where Joseph is now in charge of the prison. And I believe this adds to the case that Potiphar probably doesn't believe his own wife. Does that make sense? We mentioned this a couple weeks ago in that Joseph was not immediately executed, which certainly that's the way many of us would have reacted if we were in that position of power and had a servant do something like that to somebody in our own family. So maybe she was known for saying these kinds of things. Maybe she's made this kind of accusation before. And obviously, <clears throat> if someone tries to attack your wife like that, and if you are in a high position yourself, as this man was, uh, you certainly don't allow the man to live, let alone allow him to be in charge of anything. And yet that is exactly what we see happening here. So Joseph is running the prison, but again, it's not just any prison, but this is the prison that is under the care or under the authority of Potiphar. So Joseph is in charge of the prison when Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and his chief baker show up. So these men are not just bakers. They are not just grape stompers. And these are not the guys out picking grapes in the field, but these are men who are in charge. These are leaders. These are men who have positions of leadership in Pharaoh's administration. So the chief cupbearer, the head baker, they are leading groups of others who are doing the baking and the cupbearing. And yet here we find they have offended the king in some way. Well, in verse 4, we find that Potiphar, the captain of the bodyguard, specifically puts these two men in Joseph's care. And we find here that they are in confinement for some time. So we don't have a timeline on this. It may be a number of weeks, months, years. I don't really know if we have the answer to that question quite at this point, at least not in this chapter. But after a while, both of these men have dreams the same night. They're separate dreams, but in some way these dreams are the same. They have a dream almost together, we might say. And at this point, Joseph comes in and he notices that both of these men are dejected. And I think we would probably agree that this certainly says something about Joseph. Yeah, he's the guy in charge. He is a prisoner himself. But it isn't, isn't it interesting that Joseph apparently cares about these men in his prison? He cares about these men who are under his care. And so, you know, he's in charge, he's a prisoner himself, but he cares about these men who are given to him to take care of. So he, he's not just making sure that these men don't escape. He's not just making sure that they are punished adequately. But Joseph is concerned about these two men personally. And I don't know, maybe you have had a supervisor like this, not just concerned with getting the job done, but concerned about you personally. And that matters, doesn't it? That's a significant thing to have happen. And that seems to be what's going on here. So Joseph, once again, he is going above and beyond. And as he's going about his work, he notices that these men are upset about something. And not only does he notice this, but I would also point out that he opens a dialogue with these two men. He asks them about it. Why are your faces so sad today? And really, that's not a bad question, is it? I mean, if we notice that somebody's sad, there may be a value in asking about it. Not that we have to ask every sad-looking person why they're sad. Uh, we certainly don't need to be harassing people in that way. But I think at the same time, let's also be careful that we don't just go through life ignoring people. And I'm just saying that it would have been very easy for Joseph to do that, especially with prisoners under your care. I mean, who cares? They're prisoners could be an attitude that some might have. Uh, but Joseph, as a supervisor in the prison, he does not have that attitude. He notices these two men are upset about something, and so he slows down, he stops his work, and he asks them about it. At the end here, these men explain that they both had dreams, but they have nobody to interpret the dreams. Of course, the interpretation of dreams was a big deal back in those days, and here they were on the inside. They don't have access to their normal sources, perhaps. And here it's interesting that Joseph brings God into this conversation. Isn't that neat? He doesn't say, well, I'm a smart guy. Why don't you tell me? I can figure this out for you. I can fix all your troubles. That's not the attitude that he has. He doesn't put this on himself at all, but he directs their attention to the one true God. And he invites these two men to share their dreams with him. So let's continue tonight with Genesis chapter 40, verses 9 through 15. The next paragraph here, Genesis 40, verses 9 through 15. 
So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. So we start off with the chief cupbearer. And before I forget about this, I noticed something else as I was studying for this passage I didn't put in the notes here. But did you know that this word is used several times to refer to this man in this chapter and the next? But the word is used only one other time in Scripture. Do you know who the other cupbearer is in the Word of God? I would suggest you read the first chapter of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. And so I just find it interesting this word is used again to another very influential man who also allows himself to be used by God in, in a powerful way. But nevertheless, back here in Genesis 40, the cupbearer tells his dream to Joseph. And it's kind of weird. It's kind of awkward explaining your dreams to people. You don't know how that's going to go. Uh, but he explains in his dream, he sees this vine in front of him. This vine has three branches. It starts budding. It blossoms. It produces grapes all right immediately, very quickly here in the dream. And then lo and behold, Pharaoh's cup is in his hand. And so he does what he does. He squeezes the grapes into the cup and he puts that cup into Pharaoh's hand. And I've never really thought about this before. And I don't know if it's significant. Probably isn't it. But it's, it's something that I noticed reading this again today. Um, he's not really serving wine, is he? And that never really hit me until now. I don't know what that says about this. Uh, you know, he's not serving wine, at least in the way that we think about wine today. Uh, I suppose we might describe this guy as the chief grape juice maker. That may be a better title for this man, but he is the cup bearer. And what he does is squeeze grapes into a cup. So he's squeezing grapes directly into the cup. And then he's handing that cup to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And that's kind of neat, isn't it? And in my mind, I almost think of those restaurants where you can order uh, freshly squeezed orange juice, and maybe they have the machine over to the side somewhere and you can watch it work. Uh, they've got an orange juice squeezing machine at the Hy-Vee store near our house. I think it's almost always out of order. <laughs> at least I've hardly ever seen it being used. They've got one up at the log cabin in Baraboo. If you ever go up to uh, Devil's Lake and go camping in that area, um, uh, Don Schmudlock told me to go to uh, go to the log cabin. It's worth the drive for biscuits and gravy, and uh, uh, they have some interesting coffee up there as well. They got a bakery there, but I'm just saying they've got the orange juice uh, squeezing machine there as well. But I'm sure they have these all over. Um, but freshly squeezed OJ is pretty good, isn't it? At least most people I think would agree with that. And that seems to be what this guy's job was. Uh, he was the cup bearer. He was the chief grape squeezer in the kingdom of Egypt. And he sees this in his dream. Well, Joseph interprets, doesn't he? Three branches representing three days. Within three days, Joseph then tells this man that he will be restored to his former position. Uh, Pharaoh will lift up his head. Kind of keep that little phrase in mind. That'll be significant a little bit later. So in three days, everything will be back to normal. This guy will be back to squeezing grapes into the king's cup. Now, at this point, Joseph has one request. One thing I need to ask of you. When it goes well for you, and when you realize that I have interpreted this dream correctly, please, just this one thing, if you could just mention this to Pharaoh, and if you could get me out of here, get me out of this house. And he explains, I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. I was stolen, uh, I think as some translations say. And I don't belong here. I've done nothing to deserve this. I've done nothing wrong. I should not be in this prison. So please just remember me and use your restored position to help get me out of here. So let's continue with the chief baker's dream. This is in Genesis 40 verses 16 through 19. Genesis 40 verses 16 through 19. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, 
I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then jo Jacob, uh, Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off you. Well, the baker then hears the interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, and he likes it, doesn't he? Ah, this is good. I like this guy has good answers to dreams. I also want to be restored to my position. You know, I think he should have had a clue. I think based on the dream that he had, that it might not have the same ending. Uh, nevertheless, he shares it with jo uh, Joseph. I have uh, three baskets of bread on my head. The birds are eating it. Um, and that's not good, is it? Uh, he does not have a good ending. So he, he shares this. Joseph gives the interpretation. And the interpretation is within three days, Pharaoh will also lift up your head uh, but in a slightly different way, not restoring you to your position, but he will be removing your head from your body, in a sense. He will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. So not quite the interpretation that this man was hoping for. Now, obviously, Joseph could have lied here, right? He, he would not have faced repercussions if he had said, yeah, it's all going to end well for you, buddy. He could have said that. He could have refused to explain this to the man. He could have just said, no, I don't think, I think I'm going to pass on giving the interpretation of this one. But I want us to note here that Joseph tells the truth. God had given him the power to interpret. And so he, as God's servant, communicates this faithfully, even though the message was rather upsetting. And I know this probably isn't the main reason why we have this passage in Scripture. But don't we have a reminder in these verses, a reminder to always speak the truth? If God has a message for the world, our job is to pass it along faithfully, whether that message is positive or negative. I've heard positive preaching described as preaching that people need to hear, whether the message itself is what we would consider positive or negative. And negative preaching is a message that people don't need to hear, whether that message is positive or negative as we would look at it today. And so in that sense, we always want to preach positive lessons in that this is what God has to say, and you need to hear it uh, regardless of what it means for you. And I think that's something that I think we can learn from this passage, just a reminder that Joseph spoke the truth, uh, even when that truth was very uncomfortable, not only for him, but especially obviously for the chief baker. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph here. This is Genesis chapter 40, verses 20 through 23. Genesis chapter 40, verses 20 through 23. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So we get to the first of only two birthday celebrations in the entire Bible, at least if I've calculated this correctly. Uh, if this is the first record of a birthday celebration, do any of you remember the second? What is the only other birthday celebration ever referenced in the Bible? I'll let you think about that for a bit as we note what happens at this particular birthday party. At this birthday celebration, Pharaoh celebrates by making a feast for all of his servants. And this is interesting. I think normally when we celebrate a birthday, it's all about us, isn't it? <laughs> I'm having a birthday party. Bring me presents. You know, you're going to sing to me. You're going to have my favorite food on the grill. And we're going to have my favorite cake. And it's all about me, me, and me. That's kind of what birthday parties are about these days. But I just find it interesting that Pharaoh throws a party, not for himself necessarily. It's on his birthday. But he throws the party for his servants. And that's a pretty good way to do it. I mean, he has this uh, feast in honor of his servants. And at this feast, he, he features a couple of them, uh, the chief cupbearer, and he restores this man to his previous position. But on the other hand, he, uh, he hangs the baker. 
obviously just as Joseph had predicted with the interpretation of that uh, dream. Of course, the uh, baker is not feeling very celebratory here, uh, probably not feeling too honored at this banquet, but the, uh, the cupbearer, the chief grape squeezer, certainly is. However, we end this chapter with a really sad note, don't we? It's one of the, it's up there, like the top 10 of sad verses in the Bible, in a sense. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So Joseph is still stuck in prison, completely forgotten by this guy who has every reason to remember him. And again, I'm not saying this is the reason why this has been preserved for us in Scripture, but don't we sometimes do the same thing? Isn't it easy to uh, receive a blessing and to forget to be thankful for it? Don't we sometimes do this to other people? Somebody does something nice for us, uh, a nice purchase or a nice favor, and isn't it very easy to sometimes forget about that and maybe even not even write a note or not even to say thank you for that? And if it's easy to do to another human being, isn't this also easy for us to do with God? God has blessed us. He's forgiven us. He's given us food and shelter and clothing. But it's so easy, isn't it, to just continue on enjoying our blessings all the while forgetting where those blessings have come from. And so maybe in a similar way, this cupbearer completely forgets about Joseph. And this is the one thing that Joseph had asked for in return for interpreting the dream. I was also thinking, on the other hand, do you think the cupbearer would have remembered this if he had not been restored to his position after three days? Imagine that guy after three days coming back from the banquet and his life sentence has been renewed. Do you think he'd remember Joseph's improper interpretation of that dream? You know, absolutely. I think for the rest of his life in prison, this guy would have harassed Joseph. You said I was getting out of here in three days. You know, he would have remembered the wrong interpretation, <clears throat> but I find it interesting. This man completely forgets the correct interpretation. And again, sometimes also, we are like that, aren't we? We may remember some stupid little reason to have a grudge against somebody. We may hold on to that for the rest of our lives, never letting that go. But we may tend to forget how somebody might have really blessed us, how somebody might have done something wonderful for us. That's the thing we forget. And it's so much easier to remember the wrong, or at least the perceived wrong, that was done toward us. So back to the birthday thing. Do you remember the second of only two birthday celebrations in Scripture? Um, you know, I might have missed something, so please let me know if you think of another one. Uh, but I believe the second and the final birthday celebration in Scripture is King Herod's birthday party. Over in Matthew chapter 14, remember that, where Herodias... Um, has her daughter dance seductively at the party and Herod promises her up to half of his kingdom and she consults with her mom and asks for and receives the head of John the Baptist on the platter. You know, and that was at a birthday party. And so we've got a birthday party in the Old Testament. We've got a birthday party in the New Testament. Now I'll say some have concluded that it is a sin to celebrate your birthday. There, there are some religious groups who say it is a sin before the Lord to even like think about your birthday on your birthday. You cannot celebrate it. That's not why I'm sharing this. I just thought it was interesting that these are the only two birthday parties in Scripture as far as I can tell. Again, if you find more, I'll try to share those in class next week or you can share it in the comments on YouTube. Um, but both of the birthday parties in the Bible are for kings for Pharaoh and for King Herod, and both of them are somewhat negative. In fact, both of them involve executions, don't they? All right, in Romans 14, of course, Paul explains we have freedom in the Lord to personally celebrate various holidays on our own. You know, so if I want to celebrate my birthday or the 4th of July or anything, I've got the freedom to do that. Now, at the same time, I'm not going to bind that on the church and I'm not going to say we have to add my birthday as some kind of religious celebration for the congregation and that all of us need to celebrate my birthday from here on out. That's not what Romans 14 is saying. But I am saying that we do have the freedom to celebrate various holidays on our own. I just thought it was interesting that we have the first of only two birthday celebrations in Scripture right here in Genesis chapter 40. So this brings us to the end of our study tonight. We've seen God continue to remember Joseph, not directly. Uh, not by getting him out of prison, as Joseph might have liked, 
Uh, but God honors him. God takes care of him in a behind the scenes type way by giving Joseph the ability to accurately interpret these two dreams. And this will be significant as we continue our study next week in Genesis chapter 41. But I thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 930. We continue with Isaiah. And then after class, uh, 1030 for our worship assembly, we'll uh, get to study two verses. Uh, some of my favorite verses in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, we'll look at two verses toward the end of that chapter this coming Lord's Day. But uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Joseph, and we've seen you tonight working in the passage that we studied, even when he was in prison. We see here that you blessed Joseph, you protected him, you were working constantly toward the goal of saving your people and bringing the Messiah to this earth, even through some circumstances that were quite stressful for Joseph personally. Father, we pray that you would use us to do whatever you would want to accomplish in the world today. We pray for open and honest hearts, that we would accept whatever it is your word teaches, how difficult it may be. We pray that we would follow, that we would trust and obey. And we pray for hearts that are willing to uh, read your word and obey it without delay. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.